what you'll hear on Patreon. So how can we shore ourselves up against this when it's not evil that leads us in this in these directions, but the belief that we're doing good? How do you know that if am I the bad guy? <laughs> what criteria well, can we exercise? Uh, well, the first thing obviously is is buy and read for your mind because this is <laughs> this this is really exactly why Patrick and I have written it because um, you know we believe in the individual's ability to know right from wrong, to know their own mind, and to be in control of their own mind. This isn't just some random gene people are born with. Anybody can learn. Some people may be more naturally resilient than others, but anybody can learn to be psychologically resilient to some degree. But the thing is, when um, you know we, we interview different cult survivors, we research cults, you know, we really try to expose ourselves to being brainwashed in some kind of edgy situations. We did it so you don't have to. I'm Laura Dodsworth. I'm a writer and a photographer. People might know my last book, A State of Fear, how the UK government weaponised fear during the COVID-19 pandemic. And before that, I wrote a trilogy of books about the body. Um, probably the most famous one, Womanhood, was turned into a documentary for Channel 4 called 100 Vaginas. So interesting old career trajectory there. So with ending up at this book, I, I think I've gone from breasts to brains. But there is a trajectory, there is, of exploring what it means to be human. I'm Patrick Fagan. Uh, sometimes I ask people to call me Pat, but please don't because I hate it just between us. Um, but the reason I say that is because there's research showing if you use a shorter name or a nickname, uh, you're seen as more popular and cheerful, which I think is where I could use the most help. Um, so I'm a behavioral scientist, and that's the kind of thing I do is think about how to kind of uh, change behavior, which I do for uh, mostly for, for brands in marketing. Um, and so I have a, a foot in academia, but I'm mostly doing commercial consulting. Uh, I think probably the two most interesting things to mention, um, apart from this book, of course, I previously wrote a book about uh, marketing psychology, uh, how to grab people's attention, be emotional and that kind of thing. Um, and I was also the lead psychologist at Cambridge Analytica, the uh, data analytics firm, um, but not in the political department, just to be very clear. <laughs> There was political and consumer, I was in the consumer. Um, but that's what I do really is, is understand why people make decisions and then um, how to kind of use that in messaging, websites, that kind of thing. Well, it's very interesting because in this book, you appear to be doing the opposite. Um, so we're talking about um, Free Your Mind, um, which by the time this uh, podcast goes out, it will be out that day. It will be out, um, it'll be out and ready to buy. Um, so this book is something that you've worked on together, but you have very different backgrounds. So how did you conceive of this? And how, Patrick, how did you decide to write a book that seems to go against everything that you do in your day job? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, for me personally, um, I had kind of a, I don't know what to call it, an awakening, but kind of a, a process of realizing how much manipulation there is in the world and there are a lot of things that kind of seem to conspire to to keep us um dumb basically so television junk food uh alcohol in it in excess all of these things can kind of lower our, our rationality and make us more uh manipulatable more likely to kind of be influenced and do what we're told and then um I saw a lot of manipulation in the media around 2015, 2016. Um, and then that just really went into overdrive uh, during COVID. Um, and I felt that the government and the media really overstepped their marks in uh, overstepped the boundary in terms of what their role in society is. Uh, and these techniques, which uh, I still don't think there's anything particularly unethical about them for marketing, you know, Coca-Cola wants you to buy more cans of Coke and they'll use techniques to get you to do that. I think there's kind of an honesty in that selfishness. It's quite transparent uh, and they don't have teams dedicated to fighting Coca-Cola hesitancy. They don't feel it's their moral imperative to get everyone drinking Coke. So I don't think using it for branding and advertising is all that bad. Um, but I saw that it really has gone a bit uh, bananas. Um, and so uh, for me, this book hopefully will give people the ammunition or the armor that they need to uh, 
uh, withstand this onslaught of, of manipulation and, and to, to make their own decisions? Um, so I, I think generally at the moment, a lot of people will relate to a feeling of a net tightening and um, a feeling of being manipulated and truth being censored, verified, facts being checked, a feeling of woke ideology prevailing and systems failing. I, I had an epiphany during COVID. That's, that's when I wrote A State of Fear because that's when I became aware that large scale programs of behavioral science, propaganda, nudging, and quite specifically fear mongering could induce mass behavior. Because what all of that was about was encouraging docility with very draconian rules, um, responsabilization, making people feel that they were responsible for society's ills at that time of pandemic, that you know, if somebody died, it's their fault because they broke the rules. And I found it, um, I found it emotionally shocking. So it, so it changed me psychologically. It set me off on a new, a new career path, writing books without pictures. Um, I'm, I'm putting myself down there a bit, but I'm aware that, you know, that was quite a change in, in my career. So governments nudge us and manipulate us all the time. And it's when I became most aware of it. I mean, they're not even sorry about what they've done. That's something that people need to be aware. The first chapter in, in the book is called Realise Your Brain is a Battleground, because I think the first the first step in this process is understanding that your brain is a territory, that there are lots of different forces in fighting to get control over it. You know, you're a target. So just last week, I think it was, it's David Halpern, who's the head, the head of the, the UK's nudge unit. That's the behavioural insights team that was set up by the government though it's now independent, he talked about the use of fear being acceptable if people's brains are miscalibrated. So you would have thought that by now, most people would be uncomfortable to admit that they still think fear mongering is okay, because we're living with the, with the cost of it now, you know, impact on me mental and physical health, obviously the economy has been trashed, um, a new syndrome called COVID anxiety syndrome has been identified. We, we know the effects of fear. And that's why before COVID, and there were lots of system, systematic reviews to show it, the use of fear was completely contraindicated. But he's out there saying it's fine if your brain is miscalibrated. And I think that kind of language gives you an insight into the thinking, which is that people's brains are like bits of machinery to be fine tuned, or we are units, to be social units to be shuffled around a board. So I, I'm, um, I'm quite passionate about free thinking and free speech. I think it's essential for the individual to flourish. So COVID was my epiphany. I realized that there are no government white knights, completely the opposite. Like Patrick, I don't really take issue with brands nudging us, manipulating us, using advertising, having PR campaigns. I don't really care. I take more of an issue when it's our government because that has created a different transactional relationship between citizen and government. But I think, you know, right now, there are lots of additional reasons why this book's needed right now. Maybe we can come on to them later. I don't want to uh, detour too much from your question. But during COVID, I saw Patrick write an article that I really gravitated to. It's about the impact of mask wearing. And I had also written about that. And I'd gone about it in a slightly different direction through an artistic method of photographing people wearing masks with words embroidered on them. And I contacted him and I interviewed him for a state of fear. And we stayed in touch and we met up. We met, met up in person actually in that, that first period when you were allowed to go to a cafe again when hospitality reopened. And we're sitting outside and it's freezing, you know, we're under blankets. And I said, I've got an idea for a book I want to write about how people can avoid manipulation because I don't see anyone else is coming to people's rescue. No one else is teaching people how to recognize and deflect all the different manipulation techniques. And it's just one of those weird serendipitous moments Patrick had been plotting out the same book. So we came together over COVID um, because it was such a you know profound experience for both of us seeing how people were manipulated during that time. And that's when we agreed to write this book. So it's been it's been quite a long time in the coming. It it comes from that. I don't even remember which lockdown it was, Patrick. I don't know if you remember, but that one when hospitality reopened. The the issue with the idea that we know that 
the the problems with scaring people and with fear is that I'm not sure we do know that. <laughs> um, so I am a I'm a co-host on another channel for a, a podcast called Sublation Magazine. So we got Sublation Magazine. We run a podcast every Monday live, and my co-host uh, Doug Lane has become quite incensed about the Twitter files and about the the revelation that social media companies were working with governments to control the flow of information um, and that and they were you know asking nicely for <laughs> for certain forms of censorship to happen and and Doug thought this was horrible that the, this was a clear violation of free speech in the United States and none of our viewers I mean a very small portion of our viewers who are left wing cared and they thought that Doug had gone off the deep end. And in fact, he was absolutely rinsed for it on social media. And it seems like the consensus is there might have been manipulation, but clearly not enough. And it was a noble kind of manipulation for a good cause. Um, and more of this is necessary because we simply cannot trust people to exercise their own judgments. So do you really think that we've learned that lesson and um, that we need to? Mm. Well, that's really interesting to hear about. And I think there's a way in which I probably surround myself with people who think similarly. So in my in my day to day interactions and professional interactions, I'll come across people who think similarly to me. But I know that that's not where the world ends. I've also been following the COVID inquiry. And while we haven't had the Twitter files here in the UK, and my goodness, I wish we would. It's interesting that we haven't, isn't it? Um, you know, we've had similar revelations here in the UK, like there was the, the leaked WhatsApp messages um, that Matt Hancock had on his phone. He gave to journalist Isabel Oakeshott, who ghost wrote a book with him, and they were handed over to The Telegraph. And he talks about scaring the pants off everyone. That's his language, literally scare the pants off everyone with a new variant that they're going to deploy. Deploy is the word to use. And that's not to say there wasn't a variant, but it's like they've got it in their pocket and they're choosing when to bring it out to scare people to make them follow the rules. So the language in those leak, leaked WhatsApp messages shows the really callous disregard people had for, um, for us, the citizen, who were being frightened deliberately to follow the rules. And I found the reaction to that similar in a way. Um, and again, mainly it was among people who you would think of as being oriented to the, the left of the centre politically, saying, well, you know, it might not mean what you think and it's taken out of context or it's OK to frighten people if they're miscalibrated. And I think it comes down to a fundamental mistrust of people. And I'm sure as a sociologist, you're going to have a really interesting perspective on that. But it seems to me it's been quite a long term trend. And... Unfortunately, with the rise of a whole censorship industrial complex, you know, legions of fact checkers, misinformation units, truth verifiers. I mean, I, I can't get over the fact we have truth verifiers. It's like this whole priest cast. Um, people are coming along with that more and more. Some people believe that it is necessary because we we simply won't we won't know how to behave. And there's an over reliance on the state needing to tell us how to behave and what to think. But I do honestly think as well that there's um, a parallel culture. Um, there's a, a parallel of people who fundamentally disagree and more people seeing the light, as it were. It's a recent example. It's a bit of a tangent, but, you know, the um, attacks in Nottingham and some students were killed. Now, the vigil was held two days after the attacks. I happen to know that the banner went up at Nottingham Town Hall two hours after the deaths. This is because the UK government has a plan for how to deal with terror attacks. It's, um, it's part of what they call control of spontaneity. They want to send out positive messages about unity, forgiveness, um, so that we don't see maybe, you know, the kind of riots we've seen in France. So you can understand there's some good intentions behind it, but there's also a feeling of it being a bit artificial. And I noticed a lot of people on Twitter talking about this and finding old articles that have been written, um, namely in Middle East Eye, about the controlled spontaneity after the London Bridge attacks, for instance. And people were contacting me saying, Laura, have you heard of this controlled spontaneity? I said, well, yes, there's a whole chapter called Controlled Spontaneity in a State of Fear. I interviewed somebody who wrote plans and I interviewed somebody who worked for an agency employed by the government to implement them. 
So I think some people are becoming quite aware of an artificiality in, in messaging, in censuring of truth, and it's not feeling right to them. And I think that that will only grow because my, my perspective, at least, is that human beings do gravitate towards truth. I would say there's uh, is probably a lot of confirmation bias there. Uh, so people want other people's views censored, uh, but not their own, uh, for example. So the people who are happy with the unvaccinated being censored and banned from restaurants and, and so on, uh, probably would not have supported that being done to, for example, uh, gay people for monkeypox. So it's, it's, uh, they're just kind of supporting their, their own biases there. Um, and I try not to get into the, the left-right judgment of people too much. I think politics is, is one thing that can be non-binary. But um, people on the left do tend to want more state control. They want bigger government, more taxes, that kind of thing. So it makes sense that they may be a little bit more censorious um, and supportive of, of censorship. Um, but uh, I don't think people have learned their lesson, no, to, to your question. Um, and I think what happened during COVID could only, all the, you know, all of the lockdowns and the censorship and, and the fear messaging, it could only happen in certain social conditions. Um, so one of the really key things about propaganda is that Yes, it's produced by propagandists, but uh, it plays on your fears and your desires and, and you're part of the kind of the system and the process yourself. Uh, so propaganda usually acts as a lightning rod or an amplifier for fears or prejudices or desires, um, or repressed emotions and passions that you already have. So this fear messaging could only really take hold uh, in a society that was accepting of it in the first place. So. Um, when people were talking about going back to normal uh, before COVID, I don't think things were really normal. I think they've been quite strange for a long time. Um, and I don't think that strangeness has gone away uh, now that the COVID era seems to have passed. Um, so I expect there's going to be more of these kind of behaviors and messaging and um, responses in the near future as well. Mm. Um, and one other point is that uh, the thing about fear messaging is it doesn't actually really work. Um, number one, because if people feel they can't do anything about it, they'll do the ostrich effect and just stick their head in the sand and not pay attention to it. Or you may even see uh, reactants, which is where people do the opposite and they rebel because they don't like having their emotions manipulated in this way. So that even the scientific evidence on fear messaging is that you probably shouldn't do it. And that's to say nothing of the ethics. Mm. I, can I add something to what Patrick just said? So they, you know, he mentioned confirmation bias. And I think the other thing we're seeing in bucket loads at the moment is cognitive dissonance. So Patrick brought up the um, COVID vaccination. You know, if you look back, some of the headlines in 21 and 22 were deeply disturbing, talking about punishing the unvaccinated or freezing them out of society or that they didn't deserve NHS care. It's, it's astonishing on many levels. First of all, that the vaccine didn't do what people assumed it did. And actually people in the know knew that, I knew that. Anyone who wanted to look at the trial data would know it was never trialed to stop transmission or to stop death. It was trialed to reduce the severity of at least one symptom. So even if you believe it was right to mandate vaccination using passports, access to civic and economic society, even if you believed that this vaccine wasn't going to achieve its aims of stopping transmission, infection and, and death necessarily. But whether you believed it or not, there was the ethical position. You know, is it right to shut people out of society, say they don't, med they don't deserve medical care, they deserve to be punished or to die because they've chosen for a multitude of reasons not to be vaccinated? We have to remember that previously, up until this point in time, we've always accepted there are reasons of conscientious objection, health, you know, phobias about needles, religious objections, you know, whatever. There's a lot of different reasons. You might have had COVID and not want to expose yourself to the risks that come with any medical intervention. But people said such awful things about the unvaccinated that I think now that there is a cognitive dissonance, they have to prop up what they said before. They have to continue the beliefs. They, in a way, they need to double down. 
Um, and it is a bit depressing to see that happen. But on the other hand, we also see major public figures coming around. And so, you know, it, in answer to your question, have people learned the lesson? I'm, I'm still somewhere between the two. I'd say some people haven't, some people have. But personally, I just try to hold on to an optimistic view of humanity. The other thing I want to say that um, in response to Patrick's comments is he said that politics could be non-binary. And I think the big problem with COVID, and we talk about COVID a lot, but it's how Patrick and I met, is that actually it became very partisan. I think that anything that Trump said became something for anybody on the centre or the left to rail against. So while COVID should never have been partisan or politicised, it became highly political. And I think that's why the left took positions that they really shouldn't have done, because lockdown, for instance, contributed to loss of jobs, literally starvation, <laughs> child marriages, terrible consequences, not just, you know, not just in countries we live in, but in the global south. You know, if you are truly a socialist, you should have been against shutting businesses and shutting supply and manufacture of goods around the world. Well, that was the thing, right? If you were a very superficial socialist, you were like... <laughs> capitalism produces much <laughs> ergo if we shut that down we have hurt capitalism and they did not understand that capitalism also has an extremely destructive side and that uh, a certain amount of destruction as Schumpeter said can be creative as in um, you destroy small capitals and you can buy them up very cheaply afterward um, that during a crisis you destroy an enormous amount of value by putting people out of work by um, letting machines go rusty this sort of thing they forget that capitalism doesn't just grow and grow forever it has periodic crises they forgot about that they forgot that people need to eat in order to live <laughs> um, and I know I, I had a friend um, actually a family member who uh, worked for uh, had, had been a trade union um, activist and then went to work in a, an agency that was delivering vaccines, actually, and health supplies to uh, developing countries. And she was pulling her hair out, losing her mind because of the response to this, where she was trying to say, like, nobody cares about COVID in a place where children are dying of malaria. And yet you are asking us to to myopically focus on this one issue and and governments around the world are following on from it and completely disregarding the different contexts of all these different countries. But it's exactly as you said, it became this sort of partisan issue where you had to, it, you know, it was just no deeper thinking was invited. And in fact, it was expressly um, discouraged. I remember at the very beginning doing a podcast, I was arguing in the comments, which is don't do that ever. But anyway, it was very enlightening because somebody said to me, if you recall now, it was just after an election in the UK. And uh, some people were really mad that the Tories uh, had won and that they didn't act quickly enough. That was the narrative, right? The, these Tories didn't care. They wanted to let it rip, this sort of thing. And the person in the comment said to me, we've earned ourselves a four month staycation. What a very nasty thing to say, but you notice we've done this to ourselves. Like it had this punitive edge to it. You did this. You voted against your own interests. You deserve everything that's coming to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think um, this partisan issue was was key in COVID, and it's a really important thing to be aware of. So, as you'd expect in a book called Free Your Mind, um, which is about how to avoid manipulation, a, a big theme of the book is social conformity. There are lots of uh, good reasons for humans to have a tendency to conform but it can also be damaging and you know large crowds can be dangerous in in various ways if people align themselves with informational conformity and social conformity if they go along with what everyone else is saying in their group and they're afraid to speak up it literally can lead to damaging situations. So where people blindly accepted um, dogma slash truths in COVID, that's one That's one example. You know, there were some brave voices at the beginning saying, well, you know, hundreds of millions of people may die of starvation if lockdown happens around the world, because in countries where people literally need to drive their goods to markets, they will die if they may not do that. Um, it wasn't acceptable to say that here because that's not what the group that's not what the group was saying so the response was mistakenly very partisan and 
it, one book we talk about in our book is Cass Sunstein's book called Conformity. And he talks about how it just takes one voice of sanity to turn a cascade of conformity around. And it's something we really encourage people to do. First of all, be skeptical of what you're told. There are so many chapters and themes which touch on skepticism in the book. But the next thing is to be brave, to be, to be the voice that speaks up because somebody has to start, somebody has to have that, that courage to put their head above the parapet, which could be very uncomfortable. You know, if you find yourself in that situation where you want to speak up, you may notice all kinds of very uncomfortable emotions, physical sensations even. You may be worried about professional consequences, but reversing a cascade of conformity starts with one voice of sanity. And it really might as well be you. You'll always learn from it. You'll always be a better person from it. And you, you stand to benefit the group around you and society by doing so. Uh, also to your point, Ashley, even in your own uh, social life, this kind of destroy and rebuild uh, process can happen as well. So if you speak up, yes, you may lose some friends, you may lose some some work or what have you, but uh, there's amazing new opportunities which are uh, aligned with the truth, uh, which can emerge from that. So it can be a destructive process a bit, but in a good way. Um, I also just wanted to touch upon this let it rip idea, which again is potentially an example of a false binary. Um, the, the media, the government often present uh, one side and then they present another side. And then you see the public debate kind of say, yeah or no, um, and it's either one choice or the other. So either uh, they lock down not soon enough or they lock down on time. The, these were the two, um, the two uh, positions that were taken and that you could argue for. Uh, but actually, there's a whole range of other options outside of that. We could have not locked down at all, for example, or we could have done a very focused, protected lockdown of um, people who are immunocompromised or very old. Um, so I think that's a really powerful way to free your mind is just be aware that there's all of these other options beyond the, the binary that's often presented in the press. As a sociologist, I study social problems, and I recognize a lot of what you're talking about in your book in the sociology of, of social problems, which is my, my main area of expertise. And one of my favorite sociologists is Joseph Gusfield, um, who's um, criminally under-recognized, I think, publicly as, a, as one of the greats of sociology. And he was very interdisciplinary, uh, kind of a semiotician, an anthropologist, and, and a sociologist. But anyways, that's that's exactly what he did. When we are presented with particular narratives for understanding an issue, he says we have to challenge ourselves to think about all the different ways that we could potentially understand an issue. So he talks his his main area that he looked at was alcohol. So he looked at the temperance movement uh, in book that I go on about endlessly called Symbolic Crusade, one of my favorite books. And I'm, I think I'm going to do a series on it, actually. But anyways, and in uh, books about um, drunk driving. And he says, um, well, at the time, now this is the 80s, he says that this has been framed as a moral problem. And we're very used to this being a, a moral problem of like moral kind of um, a moral issue on the part of the driver. He says, well, we have to think about we, we could think about it in all sorts of other ways uh, about the um, uh, our transport infrastructure, for example. And now that's now it, it took many, many years, but now we finally do think about transport infrastructure around pubs and so on. But at the time, people hadn't thought of that. It was like this incredible moral uh, crusade against uh, people who were drink driving, as opposed to thinking about the infrastructure around pubs when they closed at night. It's, it's quite crazy to think that it took such a long time because we were so used to thinking about the issue in one particular way. Now, the problem becomes that when you say something like that, you risk absolving people who've done something bad of the of guilt right and and then that becomes you kind of a little bit of that guilt washes off on you <laughs> and so it becomes this inhibits sort of thinking about different ways that we could understand and approach social problems um because you know as someone who studies these things i see exactly what people are doing when they frame it as a, a moral issue, these are the bad people and they're just wholly bad and evil and so on. And we are the good people. And then you're invited to take a side. Obviously, as a good person framed in such moral and melodramatic terms, you're gonna take 
aside against Satan, <laughs> you know, that's just what you're going to do. And I see that this is, you know, that this has all sorts of consequences, this kind of black and white thinking, because society is so incredibly complex. Mm -hmm. So then I have taken a stand against all sorts of things that people think are just clear as day bad. And I said, well, no, like if you legislate against this in this particular way, you're going to cause all these problems. You have to think about this and this. And oh, boy, do people come for me. And it's become incredibly uh, professionally problematic where I, and, and also personally problematic because one of the things that I took a stand against was the idea that um, giving your children a smack on the back of the legs for purposes of discipline should be the same as assault, um, that any kind of physical discipline at all is the same as assault. And I've said, you know, I can, you can disagree as much as you want with that form of parenting, but criminalizing it is much worse. And, you know, I had people threatening to call the police on me that I shouldn't be able to have my two children. Like, that is how crazy it gets. Because not only is this just a very common tactic to frame things in terms of good and evil, but on social media, we also have an economy of virtue, as Angela Nego uh, called it in her book, Kill All Normies. <laughs> uh, and it, so we trade on this virtue and it becomes, you know, everybody talks about virtue signaling. It's an old kind of trope, but it is true. Like this virtue becomes part of what you trade on. Um, so do you think social media kind of plays a part in this? Or can you tell me about the role that you think social media plays in kind of making these issues much more complex and difficult than perhaps they need to be? Mm. Oh, I bet we can. Do you want to go first, Patrick? Um, yeah. Well, I, one thing I would say is, judging from popular music videos these days, I'm not sure everyone would take a side against Satan, uh, but maybe that's going to be another topic. <laughs> um, yeah, so social media, uh, I mean, all, all technology really, but it deluges us with information and emotion as well, which is more really than our brains can handle. And there's a great book on this called The Shallows, um, well, our book as well. Uh, but also the shallows about how uh, this kind of technology introduces a shallow thinking style. So very superficial, emotional, fleeting. Uh, even the platforms we use are called Twitter and TikTok. It gives you an idea of how quick and uh, fleeting these things are. Um, and it doesn't allow time for careful deliberation, slowly kind of digesting the information and thinking about it and being reasonable. Uh, all of these things which are associated with wisdom and with freeing your mind, um, taking other people's perspectives, uh, having humility and thinking you might be wrong, uh, trying to find a common ground or an overall picture of all opposing views coming together. Uh, Twitter and TikTok and so on don't really facilitate that. It's very quick and rapid, and it's too much for our brains to handle, really. We're all what's known as cognitive misers. We will have very limited brain power, especially for thinking about things consciously. And so when we're deluged with information, we tend to rely instead on uh, emotion and on cognitive biases, uh, such as split thinking, so us versus them, uh, or conformity following the crowd, uh, or if you're shopping online, scarcity. If the hotel website says there's only one room left and you've been uh, browsing all day and you have a hundred tabs open, you're, you're completely overwhelmed, then you'll, you'll fall for that heuristic. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Social media kind of, I think, inhibits our ability to think more slowly and rationally about things and instead rely on biases. Mm. Um, gosh, there's so much I want to say about this and I'm going to lose it all as I'm saying it, but so in our book, there are maybe three ways you could look at it as, as being able to arm you against exactly what you're talking about, sort of the emotion and the virtue signaling, Ashley. One is really obvious, it's mechanistic. You know, we advise people use social media and media minimally and mindfully, although that doesn't do justice to the chapters. You need to read about the manipulation that's used on TV and in social media to understand why you need to use it mindfully. The second thing is, you know, we teach, we teach people about the different types of nudges and propaganda that are employed, because if you understand them, then once you see them, you can't unsee them. So Patrick's just explained the um, false binary. Once you understand that, you start seeing it everywhere. You know, you'll start seeing triangulation in politics. Um, another example, this is a great one I learned from Patrick, and it's called trigger stacking. So you see emotions laid one over the other to increase the effects on you. 
one I saw last week, now I know how to spot trigger stacking, was a story about ticks. So they're parasites, we don't like parasites, which can carry diseases, which humans may, may then be able to spread to each other. So it's, it's a disease it can give you. And worse, it's spreading northwards, it's coming to us and invading us. So there's an invasion, but because of climate change, so natural disaster. So lots of fears were stacked on top of each other. So that's an example of, of trigger stacking. And, and we've got lots of different types of these techniques laid out in the book. But then the last really important principle is, is building up your own psychological resilience. So, for example, um, Patrick talked before about how propaganda works. It doesn't just work based on the message, it works based on you. And that's the work of a lifetime. But if you understand yourself better, you will be less vulnerable to this sort of messaging. You know, once you know what your emotional landmines are, what your fears are. So, for instance, in COVID, you can only make people very obedient to saving their lives if they are very frightened of death. Well, it's it's a normal death, but you know, if you've if you've accepted that you're going to die one day, it's not quite as powerful. Um, a more sort of trivial example, if you've come to terms with body image issues, you're going to be a lot less vulnerable to ads which shame you on Facebook, you know, selling you corsets or um, cosmetic surgery or thick foundation, whatever it is. So understanding yourself. And if you have a strong sense of psychological resilience, you'll just be less threatened by the messaging. And each, the, the, a number of our chapters try to take a principle of psychological resilience in that way. So you almost don't have to think, well, how will I, how will I deal with this kind of virtue signaling or emotion? You're already ready. You're a more complete human being. So for instance, one chapter is about um, knowing what you stand for, just defining what your virtues and your principles that you live by are. People used to derive that a lot from religion. We live in quite a post-religious world now, but even the atheist or the agnostic can do this by self-individuating, as Jung would put it, and, and working out what their values are. If you, if you know what your principles are and you take that into any situation, whether it's going shopping or going on social media, you are more resilient against having virtues put on top of you. So if you know what you stand for, you're less likely to fall for what other people tell you is virtuous. That was a long rambling answer. I'm sorry. There's so much, there's so much to say in response to these questions. Well, no, and I want to go into, because in each chapter you give, you know, quite clear sort of recommendations, I suppose, for how one can shore oneself up against these kinds of manipulations. And I want to ask more about some of the, the specific things that you point to. But I was just interested in, in the way that Patrick kind of framed uh, a response. Um, so you talked about we have primitive brains, we're cognitive misers. And this is the language of the nudge unit. This is the language of politics. I have an essay on my channel on the uh, World Economic uh, Forum uh, and about this presentation that was given on, on mind control and how much the language and people are like, oh my God, this evil corporation or corporations, evil like um, amalgamation of, of, of powerful people is trying to mind control us. But the thing is, they don't, people don't realize just how mainstream this is. The part of the reason why nudge is so powerful within politics is because policymakers have entirely given up on this idea of people as rational, as capable of being persuaded through reason. And instead they want to, they think, well, really we have primitive brains, so let's treat people accordingly. You know, and so they're, they think that they are simply responding to human nature as it is. And I wonder, but, but the way that Laura is talking, it strikes me as maybe a, a little bit more flexible. And I don't mean to mischaracterize your, your position, Patrick, but um, it, 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 sound, it does come across as a little bit more flexible, maybe a little bit more optimistic. Do you think there's a risk of reifying this vision of human nature that underlies some of these nudges and some of this manipulation by sort of fighting fire with fire? Uh, well, um, an interesting thing, I, I don't think, again, it's either or. Uh, we do, as uh, one evolutionary psychologist said, uh, have uh, Stone Age skulls within modern, sorry, Stone Age brains within modern skulls. Um, so, I mean, it's, you know, it's, 
it's primitive, I guess you could say in that sense, but it's also, of course, uh, not, it's also incredibly advanced and we can be very rational and do all these uh, amazing things. We can design skyscrapers or write books or, or anything uh, like that. So um, I think the danger is again in, in being too black or white and it, the pendulum has swung far too far the other way, I think, uh, with behavioral science, seeing people as uh, nudge units, you know, just uh, units to be uh, coaxed with electric shocks or pieces of cheese and to completely kind of deny people their humanity, uh, to, to deny that people have a soul, uh, that each person is the center of their own universe with a very rich, complex, subjective experience. Um, behavioral science doesn't really do that by nature. It's about behavior and it's about science. It's very objective and, and uh, observable and doesn't really take into account the nuances uh, of human experience. Uh, Although I've the... got to say, the science isn't always very good, is it, Patrick? I'm so well, sorry to drop, but I just have to say, sometimes it's not very reproducible good science, is it? No, um, and so there's a bit of a it, irony, a delicious irony that behavioral scientists, especially over the last few years, have been very follow the science and uh, how do we fight misinformation? Uh, it turns out there's loads of misinformation and bad science uh, in behavioral science. So. There's a controversy at the minute with the very famous uh, Dan Ariely. Uh, a lot of his, or some of his studies, it seems like the data has been faked. Uh, there's fraud uh, involved. Um, and there's even a researcher who did research on how to prime people against dishonesty. And it turns out the data was dishonest. Um, so, and also a lot of the research recently is kind of moving more towards um, if you want to influence behavior, it's more about kind of systemic change than about small nudges. Uh, researchers are also looking at what's called boosts, which is essentially where you help people make their own rational decisions throughout their life, rather than trying to kind of influence and nudge them at various touch points. Um, so it feels like there is a bit more of a shift um, away from nudging, which I do believe is a thing. There's a huge amount of research on it, but the picture is a lot more complex and nuanced than I think many behavioral scientists uh, think it is. But, you know, in a way, regardless of how effective, scientific and powerful it is, the fact that policy makers are relying on it is in itself important and interesting. It's of, it's of a fundamental consequence for us, the citizen, because I think you made a really good point, Ashley. Um, it's, it's changed how governments do business. You know, political parties should have a manifesto, they should have ideas, they get voted in based on those ideas because we voted for them to, to do it. And then, you know, this debate in Parliament and laws are brought forth. And actually what's happening now is um, policymakers aren't really being honest about all their ideas and they're trying to nudge us towards um, policy goals. You know, we could... It'll be a big one, but we could talk about perhaps how behavioural science is um, being used to make people decarbonise their lifestyles. And that will bring in some of what we talked about before, responsabilisation, what the individual citizen can actually truly achieve with all of their ritual subservience to, um, you know, the various things the individual is supposed to do compared to what big emitters of carbon um, can achieve. I think a lot of the panic about nudge and also because we don't, we don't like the way governments are nudging, Patrick, and I say that. Um, but a lot of the panic about nudge, um, and in fact, the way it's used is about, it's almost about denying a special status to humans. It literally sees us as units of behaviour. And you can see that play in other ways. Look at the uh, fear mongering right now about artificial intelligence. Now, even the scientists and the institutes in this field say that there's no evidence that artificial intelligence will acquire a super sentience that overtakes humans. You know, we're all very frightened about it, probably for multiple reasons. But if you see human beings as no more than a fleshy sack of organic algorithms, we're just a series of decisions and behavior. If that's all you see us as, you will indeed be threatened by AI because AI is a set of superior algorithms. It's gonna out-algorithm us, it's gonna do better. But, you know, at least in the past, people understood they occupied a special status. They're more than animals. They're more than units of behavior. Um, 
we are capable of great things. I and mean, if you look at AI, all AI is doing so far is free riding on us. Um, yeah, you've got generative language, but it's our language and it can paint paint in the style of or create music in the style of, but we were there first. It's free riding on our achievements. Human beings can do incredible things. And it's, it's something that I resent actually um, that's really at the heart of Nudge. It doesn't see us as having a special status and it doesn't see us as having the right to be totally sovereign of our own minds, whether we make decisions that are seen as good or bad by these priests of good decision making. That should be our choice as individuals. And it's really the scene that runs through our book that we want people to be sovereign of their own mind because they should be. Their minds are good. Their minds are quite wonderful. And visit patreon.com slash Ashley A. Frawley for part two.